speak to us about, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let him tell you. Lynn Sickink is here from Anthropology Department. Dr. Sickink is a professor of anthropology. She's also a member of the Environmental Studies Council. And she's here to introduce uh, Enrique. Um, so since I came to Western State College, the Headwaters Conference has really been a highlight of the academic year for me. And this year's topic is really of special interest because of my background as an anthropologist. The concept of resilience opened up a wonderful door, or maybe a series of doors, into thinking about many perspectives and many different needs. And of this cross-cultural experience for me, of resilience among different peoples of the world. And this is why I'm particularly privileged to be introducing Enrique Salmon as this evening's keynote speaker. His work with American Indians in general, and he's currently the director of the American Indian Study, Studies Program at California State University in Hayward. And along with his work with the Rarumuri, or the Paramara, as most people know them, indigenous peoples of Mexico provide him with a powerful and multifaceted lens for viewing notions of resilience and for discussing these notions with us. Using approaches from ethnobiology, cognitive and linguistic anthropology, and drawing upon traditional bases of knowledge of indigenous people, um, Enrique Salmon is able to offer a broad perspective on these indigenous models of place, belonging, and biodiversity, which Bell Hooks, in a recent book called A Prophetic Vision. Enrique's upcoming book, which is called Eating the Landscape, Stories of American Indian Resilience and Food Waste, is an example of his contributions to the subject of this year's <coughs> Headwaters Conference. He's published a number of books, chapter books, uh, chapters and books, and articles that directly address the human environment connection using ethnographic material that he personally has collected and which he presents incredibly thoughtfully. Just as a sample, one of his articles deals with notions of kinship and environment and has the engaging title, Kin-Centric Ecology. A conference session that he sponsored asked the questions, are humans good for the environment? And considered the importance of biocultural diversity in answering this question. Dr. Salomon has degrees from Western New Mexico University, Colorado College, and Arizona State University, um, the last of uh, which where he, he received his PhD. He's taught, lectures, and led at a variety of institutions, including the Heard Museum, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and Fort Lewis College. The title of his talk, which I'll let him explain more to you, is The Story of Now. All of us here at Western extend our gratitude and for, for his appearance with us this evening, and I would like you to help me welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Henry Green. I want you to imagine this big picture of these green gourds, about this big. For some reason, didn't come across on the, on the screen here from my Macintosh to this PC thing. So what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> it's like trying to unravel the, the buds from my iPod. <laughs> Let's see here. There we go. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> okay. So anyway, as I was saying, there's supposed to be a picture of these gourds there. I have about 10 slides. They're not, they're not really central to my talk. I'm just kind of using them as something to look at every now and then. But I want to first thank everyone involved in, in inviting me to come here to speak for the Headwaters Conference. This is an incredible honor for me, and especially after watching what's been going on already tonight. I'm just sort of overwhelmed from the music, the poetry, and, and the play. You know, hopefully uh, this will end the evening nicely for all of us. But um, let's see, what do I do? Hit this here. Here we go. I want to tell you a story. Up to a, a couple of years ago, 
I was a program officer for a medium-sized family foundation located in Palo Alto, in California. And I had one of the best jobs in the world. It was to give money away. And more specifically, it was to give money, make grants to indigenous communities around the world to help them to remain on their landscapes where they had been for millennia and to practice these sustainable land management practices that they had developed over, over time on these local landscapes. Um, one of my main regions where I worked, where I gave grants, was not too far from here down south in northern New Mexico. And I had received a proposal, like you know, every foundation does, and it was one of these huge proposals, like this thick, and it was from some outfit I'd never heard of before, the New Mexico Public Interest Research Group. And there was all this jargon and, and stuff in the proposal about policy, this, and, and there was uh, you know, uh, uh, politics and legalities and all sorts of other things, and all something that had to do with water. And something that was unusual about this foundation is that they asked us program officers to actually visit the communities that we were giving money to, which is kind of unusual for a lot of foundations. It doesn't happen too often. And so, you know, I, I got a hold of these guys. Um, there was some lawyer's office in Santa Fe. And I was thinking, oh, it would be a great excuse to go out to Santa Fe. I love Santa Fe. Go get some, some good, you know, some good chili and pozole, that sort of thing, you know. Just an excuse to fly out of California and go out over there. So I went, set up a meeting. And I can't remember what part of town it was, but it was a nice conference room. And there was a table, a big table, and a lot, of, a lot of folks there, maybe about nine or ten people. And we sat down, and we, they started telling me all this, this stuff that was, that was pretty much taken right out of the proposal. Water this, policy that, and you know, laws from 19 whatever. And I was kind of bored after about 45 minutes. And I think they could tell. Um, Okay, I'm, okay, good. I think they could tell, and so I, think I, I can see them looking at each other and wondering how they're going to get this money out of this guy. And finally, there was this, I, I noticed there was an elder in the corner of the room, a Hispanic guy, who didn't really say anything the whole time, and finally he, he looked at me and he said, we're not going to get anything out of you, are we? And I said, well, I don't know, you know, Tell me something that I can really get interested in. And he goes, what do you want to hear, a story? I said, yeah. Tell me a story about you and where you're from and why you need this money and what you're going to do with it. And they all looked at each other and they realized, okay, this guy's different. And suddenly I started hearing not policy and laws from 19 whatever and stuff like that, I started hearing about kids, their children and their children's children that they wanted to make sure would learn about what it means to be uh, someone who lives on an acequia in northern New Mexico, what it means to practice agricultural traditions that have been on this landscape for 300 years plus what it means to learn the stories and the songs related to these, these annual cycles that happen every year focused on water that comes in these little tiny ditches that you can jump over. It is little watering ditches. We have this incredible you know, romantic sounding word, acequia, but they're essentially they're ditches. But they're very important ditches. And everything that goes on around these ditches keeps these communities alive and these systems that have been going on for, for 300 years or so alive as well. And I gave them a huge grant that lasted over five years. And I think the foundation is still supporting um, the New Mexico Secchia Association. I didn't give the New Mexico Public Interest Research Group the money, 
what happened is I ended up talking to this elder and some other people that were in the room there, and we wrote a, we wrote a whole different proposal together, and they got the the grant, and it was just, it was one of my first grants and one of my favorites, because it was focused on this place-based knowledge that they didn't realize they had. And why did I tell you that story? Up until a couple of decades ago, if you had asked me to explain from where I learned the wealth of ecological and cultural knowledge unique to my people, Ramori, down in the Sierra Madres of Chihuahua, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where it came from. If you came up to me and asked, uh, why are Ramori people resilient? I wouldn't have been able to tell you. I wouldn't have any clue what that meant. Um, it's not like my grandparents or my parents would sit me down in periodic times and say, okay, today we're going to learn some more traditional stuff. <laughs> didn't happen that way. Um, it was mostly my grandfather, who we called Tata, uh, who introduced me to a lot of food plants as we shooed crows away from his, from his corn. And you know, we would look for little worms that were crawling up the stalks into the corn and so on, and, and uh, you know, make sure that the chilies were growing right, and you know, looking at the color change and the size and so on, you know, making sure that the beans had enough water. And while we were doing this, he would tell me little things sometimes, you know, and sometimes he wouldn't. Uh, I'd be out there in his field with this old rusted hole that he had, you know, put together, he had fixed, he'd mended with this piece of cotton cloth because it had cracked, you know, and he loved that hole. And I uh, got there and helping him dig out the, the weeds and so on from between the plants. And um, Some of my favorite memories were when we would, it would get hot and we would sit under this big fig tree that we had. And he would sit down and he would tell me about how um, tobacco and drinking gourd were best friends. He would tell me about uh, chilies and why we had to make sure we always eat chili because the you know, witches were afraid of chili. Okay. Um, during in between these sort of times, I go hang out with my grandmother. And she had this arbor. You know, it was, this all, it was made out of wood, but it was all covered with all these vines and everything. So it would literally be 10 to 15 degrees cooler inside this arbor, and she would be in there grinding her herbs and so on. And she would talk to me and tell me stories about the plants, these herbs and these yerbas, um, and how Sitakame was a relative. Sitakame gambled too much and gambled her goats and even gambled her own children. So that's why she was turned into Brazil wood. And Brazil is a very important plant medicinally for us. And so I, I learned all this sort of stuff. And it wasn't like it was stories, but it was like this ongoing narrative, this ongoing stories that I learned from my parents and from my grandparents. And today, it's now almost impossible for me to brew a cup of, uh, of yerba buena or to eat a, you know, some, some frijoles, or we would call muniki in my language, or to eat any of these kind of foods or have any of these kind of medicines without thinking about those moments in my life and tracing those back hundreds of years on this particular landscape down in the Sierra Madres of Chihuahua. These memories, these introductions all came from story. And story is, is crucial to what I want to have us think about today. And I skipped a, a slide there. See, that's how important this is to my talk here. And unfortunately, that picture is not coming up either. Anyway, I want to have us think a little differently about story, however. And this is going to pertain directly to which a lot of you are trying to immerse yourselves into, in this, to this notion of resilience. And I want to be careful about thinking about resilience. I was talking to Devon earlier, 
And I have, I'm a little concerned because we think about resilience, and I have, I'm concerned that we're starting to think about resilience as a movement. We're starting to think about it as something that I'm into, you know, as a, almost like part of our identity. And it's not either of those. Resilience is a process. Um, and it's not something we believe in or not like, you know, like global warming or something like that. It just is. It's a reflection of, of a lot of these of traditional, or shouldn't say, excuse me, these ancestral ways, these land-based ways of surviving constant shocks and, and changes to their systems. And one of the central parts of this is story. And where does this story begin? It begins with ourselves the story of self, and then it moves into the story of us, and then finally the story of now. Where did I get this, these ideas from? A number of years ago, I was invited to become a faculty member of the Center for Whole Communities by Peter Forbes. And it's this, uh, I met him originally, I was speaking at Bioneers, and he talked to me after my talk, and he was telling me about the Center for Whole Communities and so on, and then six months later, I got a letter, a handwritten letter in the mail asking me to be one of the faculty members. And my first reaction was, who writes letters anymore? <laughs> it wasn't an email or anything like that. It was, it was an actual handwritten letter. And so I was intrigued. Then I started researching the Center for Whole Communities. And it was, it's out in Vermont. It's on this 200-acre, actually, excuse me, 400-acre farm in the Mad River Valley in Vermont. It's all bucolic and idealistic looking and whatever. They have yurts and you know, meditation, and I was thinking, you know, I'm not really that sort of guy, you know, I'm not a meditation retreat sort of guy, you know, but I was still intrigued, and so I went out one summer and facilitated a retreat, and it was incredible, because what it really was, it was bringing together environmental justice and social justice leaders to, to think about and dialogue over why the movement has, has pretty much stalled. It was about the same time when the death of environmentalism had come out, that article, and then the series of articles afterwards. And people were asking themselves and each other, why is it not cool anymore to be an environmentalist? And one of the things that we were trying to get these people to think about was we haven't learned how to tell our story anymore. And we never did. And where does this begin? It begins with the story of self. How many of you are able to really tell, even know what your own story is, let alone be able to express it to someone else? Why have you been called to do what you are doing or want to do right now? Who can really express that? And not in like details and specifics, but just really telling where, you know, from the heart, why they're, you're here right now. It's not, a, not that easy. We've lost this, this skill, I think, in our society. And then, learning the story of us, realizing that we're all part of a multiple of us. We all belong to something. We all belong to families. We all belong to some kind of organization we all belong, we belong to some kind of, we're connected to some kind of faith. There's a culture, there's a tribe perhaps, a nation. We all are part of something bigger than ourselves. That's the us. Um, and we participate in these other, these organizations, these communities with other us's. And we bring them together and we share visions. We need to learn to share visions with all these different organizations and others and something that's happened in the last few decades with this ongoing movement that's now kind of a see happening moving towards resilience is we've we're we're about we're not about but we don't realize how to tell people what we're about we know what we're against but what are we about what are we for and that's the story of us which merges now into the now, the story of now, the challenges that these communities and this larger community face and, and the choices that we have to make. 
on a daily basis and realizing that it's urgent and expressing this urgency to people that we talk about, to everyone we run into, and that's the now. The progressive, the environmental, the green communities or community, they all face these challenges, but do we really know how to express them anymore? The best way to do this is through stories. Okay, and let's see if this next picture comes up. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go back. I just want to make sure the picture is there. <laughs> okay. Stories communicate our values. They communicate our values, our visions, through the language of our hearts. And I'm not talking about once upon a time sort of stories. I'm talking about just really revealing your heart and what you're about and what you believe in to people around you and being brave enough to reveal your emotions about this, these visions and about your, what's inside your heart and about your values. And it's what we feel. It's our hopes, our cares, our obligations, not simply what we know that can inspire us but what can inspire us with the courage to act? The stories teach us how to act. I know how to act as an Alamori because of what tobacco and water gourd went through and what Sitakame went through from these simple little stories that I learned from my family. Think about way back in the 60s, a lot of us weren't there. But some of us were, I think. The Wash, or excuse me, the Lincoln Memorial, Martin Luther King. Would the civil rights movement have been so incredible, so moving, moving, if he had stood there and told people, "I have a strategy. <laughs> I have a five-year." and how we're going to make everyone equal in this nation. <laughs> what did he do instead? He told a story about the vision that was boiling, that was burning and needing to come out from his heart. And he kept doing that. The letters from the Birmingham jail and the other essays he wrote about Vietnam and so on. Those were his true values and emotions that people connected to because they could see and realize, okay, I can see myself in his heart as well. That's what we need to get to, I think, in, uh, in this, this, this sort of uh, emerging movement that I see focusing on resilience here. His, his story reflected his dream. And we need to figure out how we need to do this ourselves because from stories we learn how to manage ourselves, how to face these difficult choices that we're going to have to keep facing now for quite a while, I think, and how to manage and adapt to unfamiliar situations that are already hitting us right now. Okay? Um, it's those stories that are going to do that for us. And we have to begin by telling our personal stories, our challenges that we have faced and are and probably will face, and the choices we have make and had made and we maybe will be making pretty soon, and what we're learning from these outcomes, and how we can inspire other people from these choices and these learnings, this new wisdom that we're picking up. These stories I want to in, instill in you have to be specific. They can't be other people's stories. They have to be your stories from right here in Gunnison or from Denver or from wherever you happen to be from. They can't, you know, they, your story in Denver isn't going to work in Vermont. One of the things I tell my students when I'm teaching some of my ethnology courses is that, you know, it's really, really difficult to be a traditional Apache in Vermont. Because the stories just aren't based in the White Mountains or the Mad River Valley in Vermont. They're based down in Arizona, New Mexico, and so on. White changing woman didn't survive the flood, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, 
in the, what's the capital city of Vermont? In Birmingham? <laughs> Burlington, excuse me, where the coats come from. Um, <laughs> anyway, another story. Um, let's see, anyway, where was I? Um, oh, I'm trying to get you guys to think about story and telling your own story and make sure that you are the author of your own stories. Because if you aren't, someone other, other people are going to be telling your stories for you. And they're not going to be as good as your stories could be told by yourself. I'm going to get to some resilient stuff here in a minute, but I think the story is, is crucial here. Um, the leaders like Martin Luther King or the opposite of Martin Luther King who only describe a problem but fail to identify action of those they want to bring together aren't very good leaders. A list of 100 things you can do to make the world better is kind of a cop-out. It's not going to work. If you ask me to change a light bulb, for example, to deal with climate change, what are the chances of it happening? For me, probably, you know, it's a good one, but, you know, for a lot of people, it's not really going to happen. But what if you asked me to join you in persuading Western State College to change all of its light bulbs, you know, to more um, green sort of light bulbs and so on, by signing a petition and joining you in a delegation to, to the provost's office, for example, and adding my name to this long, growing list of Western State students and maybe people from the town here in Gunnison and so on who also have committed to changing light bulbs, I think the chances of some kind of change are going to be dramatically increased. That's the difference here. And so why am I going on so long, so much about story? Because story, I think, is at the core of resilient communities. It comprises the matter, the stuff, the substance, and the glue of human capital. I mean, I'm going to point out some things here on this. I'm glad this, this picture came out at least here. Um, some of you may recognize this, this, uh, this chart here. To me, this is one of my favorite models of what the core resilience is all about. It comes from Buzz Holling, an incredible guy, who wrote a, a book a couple years ago called Panarchy. And he talks about resilience theory, and he defines it very simply. You know, it's just to seek to understand the source and role of change, particularly the kinds of change that are transforming and lead to adaptive systems and are sustainable. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this model here, but one of the most important parts about it here, I believe, or two of the most important parts, is right here at release and reorganization. And this is getting to something that Devon actually mentioned in the, the, one of the clips we, we uh, watched earlier here. But this all started with focusing on natural systems, you know, um, on uh, plant systems and animal systems and, uh, and so on, and habitats and so on. It kind of moved a little bit to archaeology, but it's not until recently when we've been able to uh, start to apply it to human communities. And when it's applied to native communities, which is what a lot of I've been doing, we see adaptation that takes place in episodes. It's interspersed with periods when what is called cultural capital builds up. Um, what in the heck is cultural capital? I want to go back to, to Vermont. Uh, if you've never been there, it's, in, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's very green. In fact, it's, to someone like me who's from the, the Southwest and so on, you know, it's kind of too green. Okay, it's like, you know, I, I'm always telling people, you know, if you got rid of at least half of these trees, I feel comfortable because I feel like someone's always sneaking up on me, you know. I, I can't see anything. You know? Out here in the West, you can at least see for a while, you know, you can see the bad guys coming or, or whatever. 
Um, but it's still an incredible place. And so I think it was maybe my second or maybe third retreat. By now I'd gotten into what the Center for Whole Communities was about up there. And, and the, 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 the place is on this farm called No Farm. It's, it's on a hill. And the places where we sleep, these yurts, and so we're on our, up on, towards the hill. And to go dip down the hill in the morning to have breakfast, you, know, you have to walk down in these green fields. And you can see this beautiful view of the Mad River Valley. And it was just one of these, it was a retreat that I had invited um, a friend of mine from New Mexico to attend, to be one of the participants, Miguel, son of Esteban. And I don't know if you know, Devon and I know Miguel, and he had come to this, to this retreat. And he decided to perch his little tent on the edge of this sloping field so that when he would, you know, he was in a situation where he would, when he got up in the morning, the first thing he would see would, was the valley below. So I was walking down the hill, and there was Devon, excuse me, Miguel, and he was just crawling out of his tent. And, you know, Miguel's from New Mexico, from northern New Mexico, Mora. He hangs around Santa Fe and Taos, Espanol a lot. You know, and so just kind of put yourself in Miguel's head for a minute. And he's getting out of his tent. It's in the morning. And all you can see down below, in the, you actually can't even see the valley. All you see are these clouds. And there's little windows in the clouds that you, know, you can look through and you can see the river down there and all this incredible green. And Miguel's, you know, he's crawling out of his tent and he's looking around and he's doing this. <laughs> and, you know, it was, because it's a retreat center, in the mornings there's silence until 10 o'clock, and we begin our first dialogue. And so I'm sitting here cracking up, but I can't say anything to Miguel. So it's not until later when we walk up to this big meeting yurt and all the other participants are there, and we can finally talk again. And I ask Miguel in front of everybody, Miguel, what were you doing this morning? Now, Miguel has one of these kind of really unique voices. And, you know, so, and he loves, he's an incredible storyteller. And... And he goes, uh, I got up in the, this morning and I looked down and all I can see was water. You remember, I'm a farmer from New Mexico. I, I, I coaxed corn and beans and chilies out of dry dirt. It was a miracle for me. <laughs> After that, Everyone was intrigued by Miguel, though. And for the rest of the retreat, they couldn't get enough of his stories. And he told stories about beans and chilies and corn and how to grow these things and chupacabras, you know, down in New Mexico and things like that. He couldn't, you know, they didn't get enough of his stories, these, these other participants. But in the, in the process, they learned so much about who he was and what he was about and why people in northern New Mexico have carried on these traditions and how they've carried on these traditions for centuries there and how they can still grow beans and corn and chilies out of dry dirt just from his stories. And that's the power of someone like Miguel, who is one of these the cultural capital. He keeps it going just by telling stories. If you ask Miguel, are you cultural capital? He wouldn't be able to tell you yes or no. But uh, if you tell, ask him to tell you a story about his farm or his, the kids that he works with and so on, you know, it'll, you'll realize quickly how this is where resilience resides in this cultural capital when we're dealing with human communities. Because... When we have these shocks, these changes that hit these communities, you know, suddenly these periods are flavored with what are called reorganizations, the new stories that emerge of social legacies. That's what I'm talking about here. And this behavior is caused by these intersections between fast and slow variables. What is that? I'm going to skip a slide here. It's right here. Because another one of my favorite models is the simplest one here. When we're thinking about cultural capital and culture and, um, and history and people's stories, these 
these um, fast and slow intersections are modeled by this, or what I call long-term memory and short-term memory. What the heck is this, is this long-term memory? This, these are the stories about um, tobacco and water and gourd and sitakame. These are Miguel's stories about you know, how to grow um, chili and beans and so on, squashes and things in northern New Mexico, and even how those foods, a lot of them came up from what today is, is Mexico, and some of them even made their way across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa and Spain and other places around the world. And it's, in, it's important to maintain this long-term memory, but if you just maintain this, the system stops. There has to be this overlap, because right here, this is the new stuff. This is the learning that I talked about earlier. This is the new wisdom that we get when those shocks hit us, and we learn how to survive them. And then we, we envelop in, it into our, our new memory here, these new shocks in knowledge from results from immediate adaptations, these innovations and learnings get so incorporated into this stuff here, the stories, the songs, the performance art. Um, you know, if you, just were, if you were lucky enough to go see one of the corn dances at Hopi, that's resilience in action. And you would, you know, maybe you'd be lucky enough to go with, you know, one of your anthropology professors who'd be able to tell you what all these little things that they're holding on to mean, where they come from, all the little symbols, why they're holding, it's a corn dance, but why are they holding pine boughs? And it just goes on and on, the layers and layers of not resilient thinking, but just practical knowledge that has become sacred. Another friend of mine, Dennis Martinez, he, he, he was, always goes on about how people romanticize Native people's sacred knowledge, but when you really look at it, all it really is is just centuries of observing a landscape and living with that landscape and taking what works and making it and keep doing it every year for centuries and becomes sacred knowledge. And uh, that's what's reflected right here, and that's the core of resilience. It's founded, it's found right in those things right there. Again, you go up to Hopi Elder and ask him to tell you about his resilience, and he won't be able to, he, he look at you strangely. But ask him to tell you a story about his clan's migration from down in, in Mexico, and, and all of a sudden the knowledge becomes layered upon layer of, of different of different uh, resilient thinking. More pictures are gone here. Um, I want to switch now over to not too far from here on the Colorado Plateau because resilience isn't just housed in these old traditions. Let's go to just that short term little circle there. If you go to the Colorado Plateau, the natural capital, the, the cultural capital are those little farmers. Go to a Hopi field. It's not huge. It's not like going to Iowa where the, the cornfields stretch for miles. You know, you can spit across some of the Hopi cornfields, but they're interspersed in different places. They're down in the washes. They're on the, the sloping sides of the, of the mesas. They're sometimes up on the mesas near the springs. Um, and the Navajo also are, are great corn farmers. A lot of people don't uh, think about Navajo and growing corn, but they figured out pretty quickly how to put cornfields on old Anazasi fields, and these, these fields that were just sloping enough so that when it did rain, the water would, would flow just enough down the, the slope and stay in this, this uh, sandy soil. And so these small fields on the Colorado Plateau and the farmers that maintain these fields are today's capital. But what's, what we're seeing today now is that well, things aren't working the way they used to. The, the rains don't come when they, used, when they used to come. They come at different times. They come when you really don't need them. It gets more hot than we, you are used to, or it's too cold at certain times of the year and so on. Things are changing. So how are we going to adapt to this? Something else is going on. It's 
It's almost impossible to be a traditional farmer now on the Colorado Plateau. You have to have a day job. Um, it's like being a jazz musician. You know, I, I play a lot of jazz. I'm a jazz bassist. And in the conversation, people always ask, what's your day job? <laughs> you know, um, so that's what's going on in the Colorado Plateau. And so people have to move to Flagstaff. They have to move to Winslow. They're moving to Gallup, and you can't really grow your fields out there anymore. So how have the young people in these native communities adapted? Um, the Notwani Coalition, Native Movement, the Arizona Ethnobotanical Research Association, DNA Incorporated, Black Mesa Trust, they've gotten together and they've created these series of community gardens in places like Flagstaff and Sedona and Winslow and so on and Loop and other places. And now people who have to work in Flagstaff can still grow their traditional foods in these places, in Flagstaff and Winslow and so on. And that's that short-term memory, that reorganization. The elders didn't like this at first. Um, some of them you know, said it's just not something that needs to happen. But another model, something that's crucial to resilience is every now and then you gotta have a revolt. Because if it just stays static, if the way of growing corn in the Sierra Madres just stays the way we grew it you know, 500 years ago, it's not going to work anymore. You've got to have something, someone that comes along sometimes and says, let's do it differently this year. Or someone that questions the old way. And it keeps things moving. But we don't forget the old stuff. We just allow the revolt to take place. The, the, the resistance, perhaps, the revolution. And again, that's crucial to resilient thinking. The native movement, one example, and Natwani as well, to represent that here for a resilient way of thinking. Um, let me go back here. Okay. I'm going to skip here. I mentioned these small fields, however, and I want to throw in another idea for us to think about. Because we can apply this to community gardens. Um, like the gentleman, Alan, is that your name? With the, the garden there in Denver. That was beautiful. And this is a new garden. But it represents the core of resilience again because places like that, or these little community gardens in Flagstaff and Sedona and so on, they are the refugia of resilience. They're where we need to look to and go to to find how to adapt to changes, to come up with new ways to do things here. Things like seed saving, low pack impact irrigation, you know, species diversity and so on. Even the, I can imagine Alan could tell us about the little micro habitats that have formed in his, his half acre there next to the church, but at one point was just a gravel field that people played baseball on. Now it's, it's another, you know, several probably habitats right there. I created a great uh, habitat in my backyard in California for snails that unfortunately eat my little squash plants and things like that. <laughs> but they love it, <laughs> okay? Um, these, these little fields in the Colorado Plateau and other native horticultural fields represent this as well. But not, not everything is, is all um, beautiful and rosy because I've been talking about challenges and changes and shocks. Um, we have to recognize some of the things. For example, if we go out to the Hopi Reservation, uh, shocks and challenges to their system that sometimes are hard to overcome. This is a, a photo Actually, I'm going to go back. A friend of mine that I've hung out with a lot, Eric Palinyamwa, he's the last bluebird, the bluebird camp clan out there in Second Mesa and Hopi. And, and uh, my students and I, when I taught at Fort Lewis, used to go out and do a lot of work with him. And one day I got out there early, or one time I got there early to, before my students, and he said, hey, let's go to my clan's spring. I've been wanting to show you this spring. He was all excited about this spring. 
and we had to walk a couple of miles um, below the mesas. And it was a hot day, and we were walking and walking. And we finally rounded the corner from this direction here, and we came around, and Eric's face just dropped to the sand. He was so upset because this spring used to be this high, and it now was this. It was this. What, what, what had happened is that Peabody Coal had been sucking the end aquifer out from underneath the Navajo and Hopi into a slurry coal out to, to uh, um, Laughlin there to fire the coal plant so that people in Los Angeles can crank up their microwave ovens, okay? But not, not knowing that they're depleting the aquifer and pretty much uh, destroying the Hopi, one of the Hopi clan traditions here of visiting this spring. But it wasn't all uh, terrible because I remember that visit and it was a catalyst for, for me giving Black Mesa Trust the biggest grant they ever got and single-handedly this little tiny nonprofit based at, you know, at, a, at a Hopi there beat Peabody Coal and stopped them from sucking the end aquifer from out from underneath the feet of the folks there. But still it was too late. Um, but these are the kind of changes that people are having to face right now, not too far from us, and reflect ongoing challenges to be resilient today. For Native peoples and for emerging other peoples that are non-Native, we're, we're increasing our hunger for community and for places that we can connect to on a personal level. For Native peoples, we come from these local landscapes and we share the breath that these landscapes breathe out to us. The land and the things that happen on the land, they, they influence us and they provide us our identity and provide us for ways of surviving changes and shocks to our systems. And the land, we realize, cares for us and protects and the people protect the land, and it models our responsible behavior for the land. Every one of these stories that I've been talking about is a reflection of these relationships and a reflection of resilient thinking. And I encourage all of us here now to start thinking about how our own personal stories, our stories of self, can start to become and be increased reflections of our relationship to our places, no matter where we're from. I think as, as humans, you know, we, we hunger for community and for places that we can connect to on, this, on a spiritual level. We hunger for the people that can say they know the patterns of changes on a certain landscape. Uh, we hunger for folks like the Sierra Indians down to Sierra Cortez who can recognize changes in the ocean currents there and how to sing to them and know when to sing for them. We want to be able to do that. Um, we want to be able to sense the shifts and seasons and the taste and the smells and the changes in water flows, for example, in nearby streams and creeks, and where to best figure, where to figure out how to best locate a garden, for example. We want this tacit knowledge of landscapes, I meaning we want to be able to have knowledge that doesn't come from books, but comes from touching it, from tasting it. Or as Edward Abbey once said, you don't really know the desert until you actually get down your hands and feet and taste it in your mouth, and get the grit in your, of the sand in between your teeth, then you really know the desert. You don't know the Pacific Ocean until you've had tons of water wipe you out um, when you've been trying to ride one of those waves <laughs> in the, over there on the West Coast. The people who know this stuff, who have these stories, are important because they hold the future of human resilience 
And we can become those people. All of us here in this room need to become these people. We need to become the people that support our communities and are creating these new resilient stories because we hold the future of our human resilience right here in our hands and in our hearts. What lessons do we have of these intrinsic, intrinsic connections and understandings that we hold that we can express to other peoples? I think they're there. I just I saw it in the song. I heard it in the song. I saw it in the, the play here. Um, it was incredibly expressed in the, in the poem we heard earlier. That's where it's housed. When we meet these folks, I encourage all of you who are still learning to ask them how they learn this stuff. Ask them to tell you their stories. And don't ask them to tell you a story. Just ask them, how did you write that poem? What did that poem mean? Where did the words for that song come from? Where did the inspiration for that play come from? How can I be a part of that? And then your story of self starts to become the story of us. And then it spreads out. Every human reflection, I believe, and story of the relationship to place and with other people are living action or examples of all this that we're talking about, of resilience, of resilience being. We've given it a name now. And Scott Mamaday once wrote, once we name something, we give it beingness. We give it life. And we give it breath. And so now we've named it, and we have to move it now into story, and then move that story into action. Our stories are our social legacies, our human capital, our reorganizations. And this is a reflection of this reorganization right now that's happening here at Western and it's going to keep spreading. And I want to thank you for listening to my, my little lame stories and for, to my words. Sure. Um, when I'm, are you referring to when I speak of native people, native persons? These are, you know, that's indigenous people, people who have, um, who can express generations of living on a, in, with a landscape in one location for, you know, for, for, you know, at least uh, 10 generations or so. I include people from northern New Mexico, Hispanos, as indigenous people. Some people wouldn't. But when you look at their land-based practices and their stories and even the language, the words that are expressed for single ideas, it's obvious that they have become indigenous to that place. And so to kind of, I, I'm, I'm guessing where you're, you might be going is that if anyone can become native or indigenous to a place. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes patience, um, a lot of patience. And it's, it, it requires a paradigm shift in our thinking about our access to resources. It requires us, for example, to realize that we can't eat bananas in December in Gunnison because bananas don't grow from within uh, 50 miles of here. And, 
<laughs> in, uh, in, in December or in November for that matter. So it's a huge thinking shift, but it's not impossible. Gary Navhan has been doing this quite uh, successfully for this, uh, you know, focusing around places like Tucson and Flagstaff, trying to get people to realize or to practice getting their food from within 50 miles of where they live. And the people who have done it have learned a lot about eating um, and what it means to eat locally. And so another way I would express that is being native is thinking very locally, being specific to a place. There's got to be other questions. <laughs> Or even satires or rebuttals or <laughs> anything like that. You spoke about the relationship between tobacco and the water board, and I was just wondering if you could share that story with us. <laughs> um, my grandfather, uh, like I said, you know, we we take a break every now and then, working in the field there, and it would be hot. We sit under the fig trees, and he'd always he liked to. Um, I like to smoke these little cigarettes. He would. It was funny because my grandmother loved these little filterless cigarettes that came from Mexico, Farolitos. And but my grandfather, for some reason, he, he would take the cigarettes and he would strip the paper off, and he'd take other paper. He actually liked the. He often would take corn husk, and he would put the tobacco in there and smoke that. He'd roll it up in, in the corn husk and smoke that. It was something from. This is a memory, I guess. And then, you know, I would look at him doing this. It would take, it was a process. You know, it's not like you can just, like, take out your box of Marlboro and do this. And it was a, quite a process, and he enjoyed it. And so I remember just looking at him, and then finally, when, you know, one day, he started telling me about tobacco and watering gourd and how they would, um, they were best friends, and they were always hanging out at Tesquinadas together. Tesquinadas are these, these ceremonies slash festivals, uh, any number of things that where my people drink corn beer during and drink lots of corn beer. Um, and it's a sacrament. The corn beer is a sacrament for us because we believe we emerged into this world from ears of corn, and that's another story. Um, but at the Tesquinadas, uh, tobacco and water and gourd were always there together. And they would cause trouble, and they were always gambling too much, you know, and they would start fights. And, and um, But in the process of doing their mischief, they would end up doing something good for whoever was there. You know, they, would, uh, they were involved in in lengthening our lives as Tarahumara, as Ramore. We used to have to run everywhere, which is why we're known for being long distance runners, because our lives were short. But uh, tobacco and water and gourd had a role in making our lives longer. And so they're important for that. They, they helped transform the very important grandmother, Wasia, into what we would call around here um, Chuchupate or, or Osha. Or if you're botanically in Latin in, um, inclined, um, Ligusticum porteri. It's a very important medicinal root that grows down to Sierra Madres. And they, they had a role in, in transforming that woman into that very important medicinal plant. So they're almost like together, like a coyote figure. And it's interesting because there, there's a duality to the two of them, which is very, un not unique, but you see it a lot in land based cultures. This, Recognition of duality of the universe, dark and light, and so on, which is today now at all Tesquinadas, people smoke. Everybody smokes at Tesquinadas. And if you were, if one was to offer someone a drink of water from one of the big ollas using a plastic cup or someone, they would it would be refused. It has to be from a water a gourd, a watering gourd that. Uh, the water is offered to, to someone. You make sure you don't drink first. You offer it first. Even if you're dying of thirst, you offer it to someone else first. And so there's, there's more to it. I can go on. I can teach a whole semester about just that topic. <laughs> Good question. Um, my question is you talk about uh, 
stories and how maybe someone from New Mexico's story might not be as helpful for someone's so -and story in Vermont. Um, how would you, but you also talk about relationships, how would you create a relationship when your stories are very vast and different um, and just becoming almost complex and trying to relate to each other with, with your stories being very different? You move your stories. Um, I'm a I'm a Ramuri living in the Bay Area of California. Um, how in the hell do I do that and maintain my identity as a Ramuri? Um, I I've done it first. My first inclination is I think about the stuff that I grow in in my in my property. I live in a a town that's it's called San Leandro, and it's in between Oakland and Hayward. You know, it's just the first town south of, of Oakland, and it's a, it's a great place to grow stuff, by the way, because it's an old part of the Delta. So there's like layer upon layer of this of a very um, nutritious soil there. And but I grow things that are culturally important to me. I grow, um, not strangely enough, tobacco, um, and it's tobacco from from Chihuahua. I grow um, different varieties of corn. Um, I grow, I always have chilies. You gotta have chilies. You gotta scare those witches away. Um, the first picture you would have seen were some of my, my squashes, these big green pumpkin sized squashes that I, that I make sure I grow. That they come from the Sierra Madres. Because when I grow these things, and then more importantly, I eat them, I'm eating those memories. I'm eating my culture. And I'm eating this new landscape that I've been living with and on now, right there in the Bay Area, the East Bay of California. It's incorporated in with my wife's um, favorite family food plant. She's Italian. Um, and you know, so that we have to make sure that we grow the her her family's stuff too. You know, so because you know she likes to cook the her marinara and whatever. She can't stand it when I put salsa on her marinara. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a new story, okay? And so I guess my point is that you, it uh, we move the stories, we make the stories mobile, and we transform them. And that's part of that, that's, that uh, resilience cycle, the one that had revolt over here and then the earlier one that had reorganization. That's all part of resilience, the ability and the willingness to allow change and to allow and accept these changes, these adaptations. What if, actually let me go back. When I was researching my dissertation and I was in the archives in Mexico City, I came across this old Punta de Anwa, these documents that the Jesuits would write in this incredible script, you know, this handwriting that was almost impossible to read sometimes. And I came across this one page, this old page, and it was it was this Jesuit who had it was up in he was up in northwest Mexico, seventeen sixty seven, and he had written down the names of tribes that by that date had disappeared. And this one big page was filled with all these names of tribes that we don't even hear of anymore. Hova, Chinipa, Temori, Jishimi, I can go on and on, the names I remember that died off. Now, my, my first reaction when I saw this was, why did my people not die off? Why did we survive? How was it? What may, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking of resilience back then, but it was that kind of thinking. What allowed us to survive? the entrada, the Spanish entrada, the disease episodes that began in the 1600s and all the revolts and so on. And as I learned more and more and thought about the stories and my, my family told me and so on, I realized it was because of the willingness to adapt, to change. We, at one point actually, when the Spaniards first arrived to Mexico, my people were actually living on the plains of Chihuahua. We had these big cornfields, and now Mennonites grow stuff on them now by you know, Fault Demok and Chihuahua City, but that's where my people were. But as soon as uh, Entrada started to be recognized, we moved. 
We moved up into the mountains and kept moving up, you know, from, first into the mountains, then into the barrancas, and down into the deeper barrancas. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is an, an area, the Barranca de Cobre, we call Ureque, which means bear claw, which is deeper and bigger than the Grand Canyon. You can fit three Grand Canyons in it, and it's a thousand feet deeper. And that was our huge adaptation. That was our reaction to the shock, and the ongoing shocks. That's how we survived when the others, just for some reason or another, couldn't or weren't willing to change. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question, the willingness to, to change, and we can do that today still. Oh, yeah, I can do this all night. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking a lot tonight about um, cultural resilience, at least from what I got from anything, and you touched on the romanticization of indigenous cultures, and I wondered if you found that that was problematizing the concept of social capital, and that it's... Um, the romanticization of what you call long-term memory, you know, discounting short-term memory, if that's problematic in reproducing and continuing and increasing social capital in our world. It's not like Native peoples suddenly 10,000 years ago decided that we were going to be ecologists. But this is this concept that a lot of people place on Native peoples that, you know, for some reason when we're born, we have this gene in us that makes us automatic you know, ecologists and we know how to live anywhere in the world and to start a fire with two sticks and that sort of thing. Um, I, going back to, what I, to the, when I was mentioning Dennis Martinez, who, who I think expresses it and has expressed it most uh, obviously when he would say how this concept, this romantic notion of sacred being of native peoples and, and sacred knowledge is really just a reflection of the centuries of observing the places where they lived and then how to interact with these places. Think about um, um, Western botany, botany's history here in North America. It only really has a history of, a, of 200 years and that's a, that's a stretch. Yet they, they claim to be experts on you know of these landscapes here in North America, when native peoples have been observing these same environments for how long? You know, if we just pay attention to archaeologists who say native peoples have only been here for twenty thousand years max, that's still a lot of time of watching the changes on a landscape, watching the interactions between insects and certain plants, and how they play a role with each other, and, and so on. Um, unfortunately, to answer your question, a lot of modern native peoples fall prey to what other people say about them. That um, you've, you have to follow your quote-unquote traditions. But traditions are very, borrowing from a conversation with Devon earlier today, traditions are static. When we're being traditional, we're just going back to something we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but now allow, not allowing it for to change. Being traditional is not resilient. Um, being willing to think about and absorb changes and new ways of doing things is resilient, and that's what uh, Native peoples have been doing for, for millennia in North America and around the world. Obviously, we live in a society where that is what drives just about everything. And this idea of resilience that you portray is wonderful. And I want to know how does my cash portray a more resilient society? And how do you see it as a role in this resilient movement? I guess? It comes down to what you do with it. And 
<laughs> I love Devon. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know we, we do have minor differences as well, which is, you know, that's, you know, that's why I love him too, though. Because um, he keeps me honest, you know. But uh, when I'm thinking about that, I, I, I'm thinking about when I was working for that foundation. And that's what I did. I, you know, I gave money away. But, but, what we, <laughs> but what we did with that money was important. Because, you know, for example, I, as I mentioned in my talk, I gave Black Mesa Trust the biggest grant they ever got. And it was $80,000. But with that money, he almost single-handedly, Vernon Masayesva, won that battle with Peabody Coal and stopped them from, you know, sucking out the end aquifer from underneath their feet. So we, you know, the choices we make with our cash are the most important thing. And that's a lot of what this comes down to, the choices we make with, uh, you know, with the car that we drive, for example, um, or don't drive. Um, if we decide to walk somewhere as opposed to, you know, driving somewhere. Um, if we decide to take our cash and buy, you know, some locally grown food as opposed to something at Whole Foods that came still from a thousand miles away, that's not being resilient, okay? Um, so it comes, you know, long answer, but it comes down to just making resilient choices. In my heart, if I were somewhere else, what was that name of that place we had a drink at last night? Gunnison if I was in a Gunnison Brewery last night after a couple of, you know, 38 specials or something, I might agree with Devon, just burn the damn thing stuff. <laughs> okay. But, you know, we have to accept this today in our, our system now. It's there. It's not going to go away anytime soon. So we can make the, you know, resilient choices with our, with our money. Like slow food, there's a slow money movement. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Let's thank uh, Dr. Sullivan.